everybody mm-hmm. knows, pardon the metaphor, but you can't you can't whip a dog three days after it craps on the rug. I don't know what is going on here. I know that this is not right and I don't agree with it. There are students that couldn't even walk to class without getting heckled and shouted at because of, of their religious identity. It's like, well, what I yeah. meant, it's like, you know, yeah. there's sorry. There's not a lot of subtext in that. <laughs> there's not, what, of course. what did you mean? You would have to go a long way to top headless body found in topless body bar. and topless bar yes i do have that on a mug by the way <laughs> i've been meaning to have you on here since your collaborator greg lukianoff told me in no uncertain terms and these are his words not mine i really don't understand why you're talking to me mike there's a woman named ricky schlott she's oh. younger much better looking and probably <laughs> smarter than me and that's Aww. all I needed to hear. I'll never so have kind. him on again. He's, he's, he's finished. <laughs> uh, that's so kind. Well, Where, I'm happy uh, to be here. Thanks. Where are you sitting right now? I am sitting in a conference room in the New York Post's office. So that's why all of the backdrop is um, as it is. I'm, I'm a full-time columnist at the Post as of this moment. So. I had a friend who worked over there, and I think... I think I took. I think I've been in that conference room. They've got like really. Well, the, the, aren't they famous like for headlines, like like the greatest oh, headlines yeah. in the world? Oh yeah, our headlines make news. It's true. Right. Sometimes they f- make me cringe. I'll write like a, a what I feel is like a nuanced and and like kind of threading the needle sort of article, and then yeah. it's the most salacious thing I could ever dream of. <laughs> Well, but, I mean, yeah. let's let's be honest. You you would have to go a long way to top headless body found in headless topless body bar. and topless bar. Yes, I do have that on a <laughs> mug, by the way. Um, they they make a mug with. The, I wish I had it here to show you, but they do make a mug with the um, the cover of the, of that day. That was probably our most iconic. It was a big one. Where's page six? Is that still a thing? Also part of the post, yeah. Right. Page six, for those of you who don't know, was sort of like the snarky, gossipy look at all things Manhattan. And if you were on page six, it was either great news or horrible news. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Yeah. Um, Every time I tell people I work for the post, they're like, oh, God, not page six, right? I'm like, no, it's okay. I'm not a spy. It's it's all good. (laughs) But isn't it weird, Ricky, how like a thing like page six which existed in such a specific way and was so unusual from Mm -hmm. that which surrounded it. It's like, and I'm not criticizing the post necessarily, but it it just feels like page six is everywhere (laughs) and news Mm -hmm. is not as prevalent. And like in some ways Mm -hmm. we've, we've kind of morphed into a, a page six default sensibility maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that gossip definitely generates clicks, especially in the the internet uh, news age, for sure. I'm happy at the post, at least, that we have our our two lanes in that sense. But mm-hmm. I do, I mean, I I agree that, um, especially in the the social media era, and and the fact that you no longer pick up an entire newspaper and you get the whole stack and whatever's in there, whether it's salacious or nuanced, uh, you you probably browse through it. Versus now, it's a matter of um, just a million different things competing for your attention and, and the most grabbing or shocking or or rage inspiring headline um, potentially rather than than the one that actually is the most meaningful, even if it's a little less sexy. So I, it's something that concerns me, to be honest. How, well, how did it happen? I mean, people have been saying a version of this cautionary tale ever since uh you know, journalism tiptoed into television and, and you know, radio and newspapers were one mm-hmm. thing and then TV sort of bitched it all up and then social media has come yeah. along and now, you know, this business of headlines is so interesting to me because I find myself in them in ways that mm-hmm. I never imagined, you know, uh, Roe breaks silence on blah, 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 right? And mm-hmm. And I, and I see it everywhere. It's like, do you think that came out of Twitter's initial sort of limited character thing? Or are we just doomed to have shorter and shorter attention spans? Oh, I think, honestly, I'm I'm realizing, I mean, I'm 23. I had an iPhone when I was 10. I was on Instagram by the time I was 11. I've been so online for 
my entire life. I was an only child. So oftentimes that was just the way that I would occupy myself. And I've been realizing more and more as I've had some free time after this book coming out to actually read and consume other materials that my attention span is awful. Like it's, I, and I do everything I, I mean, I try to limit my screen time, but I am such a guppy. I mean, I, I will write like articles for the New York Post about Gen Z employees that have no attention span and, and they're, they're so distractible and they're so woke, which I'm definitely not woke, but I definitely cannot sit at my desk for more than like 10 minutes. And I think that a generation that has grown up with like you can tap into the next thing or there's a, a the even more um, outrageous or exciting videos one swipe away. Um, I, I think that we're feeding the market for this kind of sound bite sized content that I don't think will that I don't think that trend is going to change at all um, because I mean, it's it's I've had to be su- super disciplined to try to actually get myself to to concentrate and not always be bouncing from task to task or have one browser open doing one thing and another doing another. And I, I genuinely think that, you know, I wasn't an, even an iPad kid, but once these iPad kids grow up into adulthood, I don't even know if they'll be able to get through an entire headline, frankly. I wonder too. I mean, I think it, what is it? Uh, Moore's Law in tech anyway talks about the phenomenon of shrinking technology, right? How microprocessors mm. and, uh, you know, uh, so forth, they just get smaller and smaller and smaller as they get more and more yeah. powerful. This is almost, well, it's very similar, except except content grows with Moore's Law and efficiency mm-hmm. grows. Here, I mean, eventually, it, it, what are we looking at? Headlines with three words, then two words, then one word? And then just a letter, and then just like an umlaut, then just a grunt. Or an explanation point, Ugh. right? I mean, like yeah. h- how much, <laughs> how much shorter can our spans become until we're incapable of even articulating it, it, its brevity? Yeah, I, I mean, and not only how much shorter, but how how much will we even be choosing our own path in terms of the content that we're consuming. I mean, I, I, I'm working on an article right now for the post that shows that two thirds of Gen Zers are saying that they're using TikTok as a search engine, which I mean, if you even if you put the potential CCP influence oh. aside, when you use something like TikTok as a search engine, it's not like you're scrolling through a list of things on Google and decide, deciding for yourself which source to click on or, or what you trust or evaluating it on face value. You're getting a video from TikTok and then just this endless like waterfall of an AI generated stream of content. So it's not even like you're even in control of the 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 content that's coming before you. Um, and I think that that infinite scroll sort of situation um, in co- in combination with the fact that people can't even potentially get through a whole long form TikTok video. I remember there was a, a period of time where TikTok expanded the the um, I think it was like. 60 seconds that a video could be and it went up to like three minutes and people were saying oh my gosh i can't even get through these three minute tiktok videos these are these are way too long and i like i'm i'm embarrassed to admit but i'll say so myself that i have like this habit of just going on to the next thing and um and when potentially a hostile foreign nation no less is um able to potentially influence what is just fed to you as a stream of content as well. I think that that's just the next level of dystopian nightmare that we're headed oh my towards. God, you're cheerful. Well, look, I mean, it's <laughs> it's a couple different things, right? I mean, if it's like we're all drinking from a fire hose, but we're all choosing yeah. the fire hose, our you know, our personal thing that you know can blow our mm-hmm. face off. TikTok, you know, it's like the old joke. You know, the guy loses his keys. Uh, but he only looks for them underneath the lamppost because that's where the light's yeah. better, right? And, yeah. But but what you said, I mean, it's it, maybe there's some reason for optimism. If if a platform like TikTok is expanding, it, you know, the length of time that the content can can occupy, and if a platform like Twitter went from what it was 165 characters to whatever you want now, and and look mm-hmm. at you, look what you did. All right. This is not yeah. a pop up. All right. This is <laughs> not true. a picture book. You 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 and Lukianov <laughs> wrote a tome. It's it's thick. Yeah. It's <laughs> when it first thick. arrived, I was like, wow. 
well, that came out of my head somehow. <laughs> the book, by the way, is is called The Canceling of the American Mind. Uh, shame on me if I didn't introduce it uh, properly before, but uh, the coddling uh, preceded this by our friend mm-hmm. Greg Lukianoff. And when we had him on the podcast, I, I'm not kidding. He was so, well, you know him better than I do, but he was he's so taken with the subject. He's so passionate about fire. Um mm-hmm. But he was really, really taken with you, and he was he was so excited to tell me about this young woman with this big brain who shared his passion for this thing. So I guess maybe we should like officially start with, you know, how in the world did you wind up collaborating with that old bearded man, and why do you <laughs> care so deeply um, about this issue? Because full disclosure, the people listening to this podcast, by and large, I think a lot of them have probably have kids your age, and they're scared, mm-hmm. Ricky. They're worried yeah. to death that the entire glittering, top-heavy superstructure of our academic world is is starting to fall apart beneath them, mm-hmm. and they don't know what to do. And you've had a front row seat to it now for a while. Yeah, I mean, my front row seat, um, unfortunately, starts. What I to all the craziness starts back when I was 14 and I, I can remember um, I was a student at the Lawrenceville school which is a, a prep school in New Jersey um, and right next to Princeton University and a lot of the kind of trickle down craziness from academia showed up there and I still remember the first moment when I you know 14 years old a freshman in high school worried about boys and acne and not politics and um, not yet activated, but on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, they had us come into school um, and they brought us all into the auditorium and I'm sitting next to my best friend um, who's an Indian American and they tell us, okay, time for the white students to go into this building to talk about your racial experience and the Asian American students to this building and the black students to this building. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I don't know what is going on here. I've never been racially segregated in my life, let alone by uh, supposedly progressive administrators. But I know that this is not right and I don't agree with it. And that was when I just became skeptical of the world around me. And that continued to the point where I got to NYU as a freshman in 2018 and was hiding books under my bed, my Jordan Peterson and my Thomas Sowell books, uh, <laughs> because I was literally afraid that somebody might call me out or or label me another because it's a very progressive school. Um, and ultimately, I think those fears were warranted. I, this book um, demonstrates that cancel culture is very much a real and tangible issue. Um, but unfortunately, I just was not being honest and authentic in myself. And also in 2018, I happened to read The Coddling of the American Mind, which I I found was a, it diagnosed a lot of the 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 symptoms that I was observing, but I couldn't really get to the root cause as, as someone within Gen Z and who was, you know, uh, definitely guilty of some of the, the great untruths that, that they called out. And it was a, a really um, like kind of meta- experience for me where I could zoom out and and understand um, what was going on from a deeper level than just kind of my anecdata uh, observations. Were you there at the height of like the safe space and the aromatherapy candles and the crying closets (laughs) and all of that? And coloring sessions and, and the administrators would set up like in the library you know, crayons and and adult coloring books during finals and all of that stuff. I mean, in fact, on the back of my NYU ID card that I picked up my first day on campus, um, you know, to scan into all the buildings, it has the like 911, it had the phone number for the student health center, it had the phone number for uh, uh, the, the campus police, like things that you would potentially need as a student alone in New York City and also the phone number for the bias response hotline in case you you feel perturbed or offended Um, and that same phone number was plastered on the back of the bathroom stalls in the library 
um, and basically was an institutionalized snitch culture where you could call an administrator and and report however you feel aggrieved. And ultimately, the school released a report on how that was being used. And one of the examples that they listed um, in in the sorts of reports that they were getting was that someone had called to say that the the posters around campus promoting the school with student photos in it were not diverse enough um, to reflect the student body and they felt the need to call the bias response hotline. So if there's a way to make professors and students and certainly heterodox ones at that uh, self-censor, it would be to place a hotline uh, all over the walls and the wallets of the community members for sure. Um, So yeah, I was definitely there in the thick of it. I was I kind of kept my head down. I was a 4.0 GPA student. I I felt that I had to kind of walk the walk and bite my tongue and sit on my hands in order to succeed. I do believe that that is probably true in some contexts, although I, I wish in retrospect that I had been bolder. But um, what really was my impetus to speak out was in 2020 when the pandemic was going on and, you know, the, the height of... Um, cancel culture surrounding Black Lives Matter and did you post the black square and just I, I it felt like the world was spiraling out of control and at that point in time I was with my mom out in LA and they were trying to pull the the great trick of charging full tuition for Zoom school and my mom said you can take a leave of absence and do your own thing for a semester just make it worthwhile and use your brain it should um, be and what uh, I, noted Ricky that you're talking about NYU you're talking about one of the, one most, of the most expensive, expensive schools in the country, if not the most expensive, right? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly up yeah. there with Harvard and Yale and so oh, forth. Oh, yeah. Can I ask Absolutely. what your tuition was back in, what was it, 2020, 21? Oh, uh, I think I I didn't live on campus, but I want to say if you did, it was like $75,000 or something like right. that. Right. Somewhere in that in that range. Yeah, is that it, a, I mean, is that one a semester of, or is that a year? How did that? Work? A year. A year. Okay. I think. So four yeah, years, I think including over the year. Yeah. Or room. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the most expensive schools in the country with a billion dollar endowment, and I'm not sure where that endowment should be going if not to relieve um, students from from the the burden of tuition during a, an active pandemic, but. I did my one semester. I got through my, my Zoom semester and my mom gave me the the thumbs up to take time off, but to to be purposeful with it. And what I decided to do was actually read the stack of books that I'd acquired of um, things that I, I felt interested in and passionate about, but I'd just been reading whatever was assigned to me. And despite having done two years of a philosophy program at NYU um, and a like accelerated liberal arts degree essentially in my mm-hmm. first two years, I had never read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. And I read that during the pandemic and it was like, it just like a switch flipped in my head or like learning to ride a bicycle and I just couldn't unlearn it and unsee how I had been taking for granted all of the the freedoms and the, the classical liberal values that underpin my freedoms. Um, and I just didn't understand the philosophical basis for free speech and and how in my opinion that's the most important freedom that we're afforded in a society and i just that just ignited a a passion in me and i couldn't put that away and so i started writing for the new york post and i interviewed greg for an article about whether the pandemic would uncoddle gen z which it did not so far back up back up one day it will what do you mean you started writing for the new york post right okay so i started well so in college and you're like oh (laughs) you know what i'm gonna do today i'm gonna start writing for the post that's what i'll do i was gonna play tennis i did a lot of (laughs) um so i did a lot of kind of uh scrappy LinkedIn DMs and and cold emails and ended up finding a a tremendous editor here at the Post who um, I sent an essay that was absolutely inappropriate for the Post too, but she said, there's something here and let's talk about some other ideas. And ultimately, um, one of my first articles was about the degradation of of free speech at NYU, um, which I wrote while still technically a matriculated student there. Um, and that ended up taking off. I heard from so many community members who said, oh, I completely agree with you and everything that you said, but just don't tell anyone that we don't had this Don't tell anybody we had this conversation. Okay. Exactly. So, yeah. So that, I mean, look, I, we're probably going to bounce around a little bit here, but that 
that's such an integral part of yeah. the necessary ingredient to self-censor, to stifle, and to ultimately mm-hmm. wind up in a world where there's a hotline for everything in every bathroom yeah. stall. Because on the one hand, you're you're being affirmatively encouraged, wildly encouraged to articulate the slightest provocation or offense, while at the same time, profoundly cautioned not to step outside the line or say the wrong thing. So it's those, yeah. it's those two things happening at the same time. Um, but the fact that you were able to parse that probably has something to do with your the reading materials under your bed were Jordan Peterson and and you know so forth uh wealth mm-hmm. of nations or whatever i had mad magazine and and playboy when i was your age you know <laughs> and so so it is intensely interesting to me as to as to why you were able to to pivot as early as you did and ultimately how mm-hmm. you wound up writing this i mean this book is selling like crazy and you've got your your little hands right on the pulse of something really, really, really important. And I know you're sick of hearing it, but but damn it, Ricky, you're 23. What, how does this even, <laughs> I'm just, how does this happen? Well, I would say that I was blessed with a pair of parents who definitely could not have been um, more helpful in getting me to that conclusion quicker. I have my mom's of Eastern European heritage and kind of has that no nonsense sensibility, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Like there's no whining in my household. And I had that in combination with a father who is 86 years old. I was a very late addition to his family. And I think that growing up and having that, that breadth of history, even just at the family dinner table was so invaluable and something that I, I mean, I would come home from school and say, you know, try to, a couple of times, not in a rude way, but just in a naive kind of childlike way as like a second grader, like tell my dad, oh no, we don't, we don't say African-American anymore. We say black now. And I remember very distinctly one night at dinner where he was like, they just changed the rule from black to African-American like yesterday. What do you mean? We don't say that anymore. And we're saying black now. And I think having a parent anchored in a different period of time made me a little bit more resistant to the generational tides um, and definitely made me wake up a little faster. But I also would say, I don't think I'm, I'm definitely not like typical in terms of my politics, but I don't think I'm alone in my generation um, in, in a, a meaningful plurality of young people who I think the pandemic was just really a formative moment for them. Um, and it might have activated a bit of a libertarian energy that might not have been there before because it was just such a, a profound eclipse of, of our liberties at a young and formative age. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if there aren't more and more young people who are kind of waking up and, and maybe it's not the same traditional right and left binary or they're not all becoming like Reagan Republicans, but I do think that there's a, a splintering and some some meaningful questioning that's going on for some people who who saw the pandemic and a lot of the the um, I think sometimes irrational government responses to it um, as as a formative life event and maybe a wake up call um, in terms of actually making them realize that liberty and freedom are important values. Um. Yes, a thousand times yes. But just so Chuck and I are on the same page, where are we with the black and American uh, American <laughs> thing again? I think, we, African American? I think we say What's, black now. It's black now? With a right. Yeah, it B. might have changed. But also BIPOC. But then that one changed a few times as well. BIPOC, um, people of... Uh, black and indigenous people of color. It okay, was POC, right. but then they had to put the BI first because mm. it was, a, I think, a way to... Um, like exclude Asian Americans from the people of color umbrella. It was like a more exclusive sort of. I want to talk about Asian Americans in a minute (laughs) because I, I, I I can't think of a group being more discriminated against right now in Mm -hmm. higher ed. But I also want to check you on something earlier you said, just because I, I can't keep up, but I think you described somebody as an Indian American uh, Mm -hmm. in the early part of our conversation. Is that, De rigueur, or is that uh, accepted now? What does, what's... Um, 
I think so. I think so. I, I I've not heard that that one's been updated, but I'll have to I'll have to call Vanya and make sure that I haven't missed. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm kind of only half joking because it, it yeah, seems no, like I, like part of the early canceling, the early wrist slapping really starts if you, you know, if you misidentify not just an individual, but a but a group of individuals. And yeah, man, the stakes for doing that are are high. Absolutely. I mean, I um, so I ended up dropping out of NYU at that point in time. And right now um, I got into Columbia and I'm just kind of taking a, a little buffet of some classes that I think I'll enjoy. And then I'm dropping back out um, because I don't feel the need to to go through all the requirements and um, all the kind of bureaucratic checking boxes. I'd, I'd just rather take some classes I'd enjoy um, and it, that I feel are, is worth the money. Um, but I had my first class last week and that going around the table and, and, and I mean, I'm all for respecting people as much as possible, but some people have some really confusing pronouns that I don't even know how they function in like the English language. And I, I don't even think I could refer to that person with a pronoun because I've never heard it before. So I'm not sure how to decline it in, in a sentence as I'm having a conversation with them. So that's a tripwire that even wasn't there when I left NYU like two or three years ago to the degree that it is now. I, I just, I, I think to be a college student certainly, um, or to be someone on the internet that's public with their beliefs or, um, I mean, it's, it's just a ton of tripwires everywhere and they, they seem to be multiplying every time I, I come out of my little echo chamber here at the New York post, there's something new to ensnare me. So, well, speaking of that, what, what was your take? Oh, I mean, I'm I'm sure you've thought a lot about this, but between Liz McGill and between Claudine Gay and I, I don't know how much you know about me, but you know I've been for 15 years taking a a fairly measured stance between you know my foundation focuses on uh, trade schools uh, mm -hmm. simply because you can't boil the ocean, and it just seems to me that that's where the shortages are. But I've 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 been careful not to, you know, blatantly disparage higher ed because I mm -hmm. I don't like cookie cutter advice and I and I do think that there's a lot of great things still to be said about Columbia and NYU and so forth. But the last two months, Ricky, I I'm out of I'm out of platitudinous defense. I don't know what to say about the Harvard Corporation other than, are you kidding me? $51 billion <laughs> in an endowment and your soft peddling, blatant plagiarism issues, you're equivocating. Do you think it was her fear of being canceled that led to such a dismal performance in front of Congress? And I'm speaking about all three of the presidents who were there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, for once on campus, there was a fear of cancellation from both sides of the of an issue. Um, it wasn't just, you know, do the the left wing performative, like take take the most PC possible path and you won't get canceled. Now, there were it the Israel Palestine divide, I think, really defied the, the typical right left. Um, and I think she tried to appease everyone and ended up sounding like an insensitive and lawyerly um person who just didn't have a backbone. Um, and I, I mean, even as a, even if she's right on, on the free speech issue, uh, to a certain degree, I think the the bridge's irony, in my opinion, is to see a school like Harvard, which was dead last on fires, free speech rankings this past year, and literally got a negative score to hear that they've suddenly, uh, discovered that free speech is a value that's worth being upheld and that institutional neutrality is worthwhile and that uh, an institution is made up of people with opinions and is does, should not have an opinion itself. Um, just suddenly now, in the wake of October 7th, I think that the timing is is really revealing and disheartening. And I, I completely commiserate with Jewish students on these campuses who feel totally um, just 
jilted by this and, and shocked to see that this is the state of American higher education. Uh, I And it's the most elite schools, ironically, that are apparently having the, the biggest issue realizing that anti-Semitism is actually bigotry when they're, they've been so obsessed with every other possible form of bigotry that they could sniff out of any corner every for years. Reason. I think the irony is yeah. just unbelievable. So, I mean, to say the same thing in a slightly different way, had these women, Cornbluth, McGill, and and gay had a long track record of being free speech absolutists, then they could have mm-hmm. sat there and they could have said, look, you know, it's it's incumbent upon us yep. to accept that which we find most abhorrent. And that is the, the hymn book from which we've always sung. But they couldn't yeah. because just months earlier, they were throwing people out for misgendering. They were throwing mm-hmm. people out for so many things. So is it is it the underlying cancellation that worries you most or is it the rank hypocrisy that is just sort of unveiling this whole thing? I mean, I think I think it's the the cancellation that caused the or all these cancellations that caused the hypocrisy honestly. Like the the fact that they're even put in this position in the first place, I think is the root of it is that they have just totally abdicated their responsibility to uphold free speech for so long. And continuously, uh, FIRE surveys will find that among the most contentious issues that students feel that they can't discuss is the Israel-Palestine conflict. And, you know, there's a, a way to have civil disagreement on certain aspects of that or actually have a conversation with someone um, who might disagree with you. And and yet, these schools did not make themselves the forum for for those sorts of conversations for years on end. And unfortunately, what happens when you stifle speech and when you don't allow dissenting viewpoints to to collide in a um, civil discourse and dialogue, especially on a college campus where people tend to have rad- radical and hot headed beliefs, um, if you make them like push them underground they will fester and they will come out the other end as harvard students that are championing hamas which seems unbelievable if you haven't been watching the the trajectory there but if you have watched the fact that that kids have not been having normal and rational conversations and that at the same time they've been taught this sort of oppressor and oppressed um dichotomy then i i mean to me i i understand those who haven't been in academia recently might have been shocked by the way that elite higher ed has responded. But frankly, like I'm I'm not surprised to see that this is the state of universities today. Help me then with this. I I mean, I've been pretty vocal about my own uh feelings toward cancel culture. I you know, mm-hmm. I mean, especially in comedy, especially in my industry, only because, you know, I remember watching Oh, what was his name? Chris uh, Harrison, I think, from The Bachelor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, that was so me, bad. I mean, for me, right? A guy who makes his living, you know, he and I do a do a lot of the same things. And mm-hmm. I mean, refresh my memory with that, right? It was somebody. Yeah. It was a debutante party, and a woman, a, a contestant. It came out, and he kind of yeah. defended her. It was a. A photo of I'm gonna fudge the ages here, but I want to say she was like 26 when she was on The Bachelor, um, and she was ended up being the winner of the season. Um, and it was a photo that surfaced, I think, towards the end of the season, of her when she was a teenager, like 19 probably, um, at a college. I think she went to a large state school in the South, and there was a, a sorority or a fraternity party that a frat hosted that she went to as a sorority sister um, that was antebellum themed. And so she was photographed with a bunch of other women um, like dressed in, in period clothing. It's gone with the wind basically. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so what happened was she ended up just getting totally piled on and she was just like some hapless girl on the bachelor. So she didn't know what to do. And it was in 2020 and she ended up apologizing, but before she apologized, uh, Chris Harrison didn't even say, "Oh, I, you know, it's okay that she did that." Uh, she, she, he just said, "I don't really want to comment or or pile on to her before she can actually respond herself, and we should afford her some grace." And A I think he literally grace, used the word said, grace. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep, he did. And that, not even defending her, but just saying, like, let's cool down for a minute. He ended up, I think he was like 20 seasons on The Bachelor, and then all of a sudden, poof, he's gone. Um, which I also think kind of tanked the the franchise entirely. Um, but that, I actually, I completely agree with you. I always bring up that anecdote. And I, f- I feel like that's never people's first go-to in, with cancel culture. But that was so absurd to me that grace was a cancelable offense. I, I completely agree that one was The fact ridiculous. that he suggested the mob put their pitchforks down just right. for a moment to let the world yeah. spin God forbid. was egregious. And I, I remember calling my partner at the time and saying, look, I'm <laughs> I'm looking back at, you know, 10 seasons of Dirty Jobs, and I can't think of a single episode where I didn't do or mm-hmm. say something on international television that by today's standards would have absolutely positively demanded yeah. My, yeah. my immediate removal. And so, yeah. you know, it's... I think I think the thing that's so interesting isn't that the rules have changed, right? Mm-hmm. It's how, in the same way, it's not interesting how how page six suddenly is much bigger than a than a page, or how the headlines have done all the things they've done. All that stuff is interesting, but what's super interesting is how freaking fast it happened. Yeah. Like for me, I woke up one mm-hmm. day and there's a whole new set of rules. There's a whole new set of names. There's a whole new category of genders. There's unlimited genders. There's yeah. it's like, are we, are we just like trolling ourselves? Do we really believe these things, or are we just trying to get a rise out of our fellow man? Well, I mean, I can I can tell you that consistently when you look at public polling. Um, that roughly 80% of Americans believe that cancel culture is a problem and believe that political correctness has gone too far. And it's not that most people believe it. It's just that that tyranny of the minority. I mean, I would I would bet that remaining 20%, 10% don't even really, aren't even plugged into the conversation. And it might be a 10% tyranny of the minority that would actually say, no, cancel culture is not a problem and political correctness hasn't gone far enough. But the problem is those are the squeakiest wheels. And I saw even on an NYU's campus, all it takes is one really outspoken, ad hominem, nasty student at a table to shut down an entire conversation. Um, And I think that we're seeing that on a mass scale. Those voices are getting amplified on social media. And also, I think all these rules and also these very public takedowns, um, the part of the reason why we define the modern age of cancel culture in our book is starting in 2014 is because social media um, really kind of began to proliferate at that point in time. And it was like a memification of of this tactic to take down your opponents because rather than actually meaningfully refute whatever you might say to me, I just say, oh, you're a cishet white male and I never even have to deal with it. You just get canceled and, and your point doesn't matter. Um, and social media is the perfect forum to do that and also to get retweets and amplification every time you do. Right. Constant feedback, constant, constant uh, approval, right? Uh, but look, yeah. Chris, Chris Harris, I, I don't I, I haven't seen Chris Harrison do anything since he stepped away from The Bachelor or since he was fired. And may, may, maybe he doesn't want to. I have no idea. But I mean, it looks yeah, like I'm not destroyed, sure. I haven't seen him either. It, yeah. it just looks like a wrecked career to me. Yeah. And and I wonder if the exact same thing happened today, that if he would the mob have still come or or have other mobs on the other side started to close ranks and would and would people defend him? Would mm. would people today have the courage to defend Chris Harrison? Um, because I look mm. at Chappelle and I look at Ricky Gervais and I and I look at people, you know, I thought Netflix took a pretty principled stand yeah you know totally um 100 they and they could have buckled spotify could have buckled right mm-hmm. with the business with joe rogan with rogan. joe rogan yeah right but but abc buckled abc let chris be run out on a rail and i mm-hmm. and i really wonder you know if if they would do that today yeah, I think we're seeing more of a corporate backbone um, for sure, which I think is a, a positive development. I it, it seems that a lot of corporations just did not know what to do with the 23-year-old woke hires that wanted the scalps of their CEOs on the wall. But I And placating them was the first instinct and um, 
that obviously doesn't really work. Um, so I'm glad to see that there's definitely a, a shift in the corporate world. I, I think that will have meaningful uh, a meaningful impact going forward. But I would also say that I there it's very easy and people frequently have throughout the past decade said cancel culture is over. You know, after 2016, it seemed to kind of cool off and we said, oh, okay, that was just a really weird election, but we'll just put that behind us. And then um, that all seemed fine. And then 2020 happened and it was even worse and, and fire got 1500 cases in just one single year, the most they ever have. Um, and then after 2020, we said, oh, okay, that was a pandemic and like, oh, maybe it's fine. It, it could be over. And then the Israel Palestine thing happened um, and there's a whole new host of free speech issues that come with that. And I am really scared of what a 2024 election looks like. So as much as I wish I could say it seems like things have kind of passed and maybe people will actually have strength in numbers. I, I really think that a, a society that isn't really um, all mutually bought into the the principles of free speech and, and what that means to actually comport yourself in a, a free speech positive way, even if you might be the champion of free speech, sometimes I see a lot of people on the right are that by default because they see their own speech attacked, but that they might not actually have the principles of classical liberalism totally down. Um, and unless we can get that foundation right and that social contract agreed upon, I think every time that we have social unrest, it will inevitably erupt into an illiberal, like scrappy fight and mess, frankly. What do you say to people who who say, look, cancel culture is, is really just a form of consequence. And mm. I'm for free speech, but I'm also for the consequences of being a fool. And full disclosure, when I watched those knuckleheads give that unbelievable testimony, I reveled in the idea that there would be consequences. I knew there would be consequences. At some point, mm -hmm. the donors are going to stop writing checks and alumni mm -hmm. are going to start saying, hey, you know, what maybe, you know, people are going to start taking their diplomas off of their walls because they're going to mm -hmm. stop being hallmarks of pride and harbingers of shame. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this idea that, that people like to be a big supporter of free speech, I feel like I have to also say, you know, that just means I'm talking about First Amendment speech, the stuff that doesn't get mm -hmm. you thrown in jail, but might cost you your friends, might cost you a job. So how mm -hmm. do you draw the line in between the consequences of being a grown-up who mouths off versus this protected, coddled class that you're so worried about? Mm, yeah, I mean, I would say that in the in the cases of the university professors, I mean, I think there were some cheap pile on ad hominem attacks that I I would say um, fall beyond the 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 pale of actual consequences um, and just is is unhelpful kind of fodder. But I do believe that as a university president, your job is to is to create a, a safe a legitimately safe space for your your students to to study in and i mean we see in harvard um just i got got the other night a, a video from a student there with the most heinous graffiti that he he had seen on campus and there are students that couldn't even walk to class without getting heckled and shouted at because of of their religious identity um and i think that you know, abdicating the responsibility to create a, a literally safe space, not the kind of figurative safe space that we're talking about for students, and also failing so dismally in your role to create a, a, a community that um, can have a, a, a healthy conversation and um, and to to lead a community in a, in a way that inspires pride is a, a meaningful set of reasons when you add plagiarism on top of it too um, to potentially call your job into question. However, I would say to the to the typical pe like example of oh it's it's just consequence culture it's not cancel culture. Um, I, to me, the proof that that's not true is that so frequently you see the cancel mob like do their offense archaeology and find something from ten years ago that someone tweeted and and someone say oh my gosh I'm so sorry I don't mean that anymore and that's not me but the apologies never matter if it was actually about consequences or about trying to make a difference then an apology would appease the mob but so often we see that an apology just 
just the opposite. And it's not about trying to get someone to atone for a point. It's about taking the person down. Okay. Well, I, I love that expression. Would you call it archaeological? Offense archaeology. Offense Which is not our term. I We did, I think we credit it in the book, but I can't remember the original but uh, it's origin. it's 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 very much along the lines of you know dragging a statue down because now we have a sudden understanding a new understanding mm-hmm. and we're going to apply this new understanding to the old days you know you find mm-hmm. a picture of a girl at an antebellum party and you're going to punish her 10 years later Every, everybody mm-hmm. knows pardon the metaphor but you can't you can't whip a dog 3 days after it craps on the rug doesn't take mm-hmm. you know you you, mm-hmm. you can't you can't do that. But in real time, when I look at those guys in, uh, I think it was Australia, chanting, gas the Jews, kill the Jews, right? I saw them on TV doing it. Now, do I think they should be thrown in jail? No. But mm-hmm. do I have a problem with them being doxed? Do I have a problem with them being identified, right? Right. Do I have a problem mm-hmm. with their bosses firing them? Do I have a problem with future employers going, oh, you were you were screaming gas the Jews. I saw you six months ago. No, thank you. Right? Mm-hmm. Honestly, Ricky, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem mm-hmm. with, with that group of people paying a very, very steep cost for exercising their freedom to speak. So I wonder mm-hmm. if that makes me less of a... <laughs> Less of a free speech absolutist, uh, you know, because here I am. Ad, I'd like to see those idiots canceled. There, I said it. I'd like to see it. Mm-hmm. I would like to see people who protested at those big universities. I loved it when those big Wall Street law firms said, nope, don't even bother applying here. So am mm-hmm. I Am I conflicted? Am I am am I a hypocrite for rooting for the cancellation of those careers? You know, I this is a moment where where Greg's expertise um, would definitely be of help because he in our book we talk about the contours of public employment law and how if you are a public employee, there there are certain contours to your free speech um, rights, and you you can't just like decide to get naked in the workplace or call your your uh, co coworker fat or curse at them and those are all contours that we reasonably have in a workplace setting and so um there are you know calling for the the genocide of a a, a minority group is certainly i think within the confines of things that an employer is is totally free and and frankly within their well within the bounds of their rights to use as a, a factor in deciding whether or not to hire someone. I one thing that did worry me in um in the the wake of October seventh though is I I was concerned about the blacklist situation that happened immediately when it was not just the you know the student who's out there being the most loud and proud and signing their name to an email and saying that, you know, Israel brought this upon themselves, but it was anybody who was potentially a member of a student group whose president might not have even seen the email or it's like within one day. And frankly, I I can say having known a lot of college students in the lead up to this point in time, a lot of them are not up to date on international politics and affairs and probably get their information from TikTok. So I would say I I I don't where I start to get nervous is when it's less a case by case basis thing and just a, a kind of blacklist situation. It feels a little McCarthyism vibes to me, and I don't like that. And I also think young people who are, you know, still trying to figure themselves out if they change, I would I would like to afford them the opportunity to do so. The words you're looking for, I think we just talked about. It's the Chris Harrison it's paradigm. The grace. It's grace. You can. Yeah. You can extend some grace on October 8th to people who are reacting to horrific visuals on either side. And mm-hmm. and you can just say, look, I'm going to I'm going to kind of ignore what you just said because it's so in the moment. It's so mm-hmm. raw. It's so happening that you couldn't have possibly taken the time to really think through your view. You're reacting. But at some point, right? At at some point, I I just feel <laughs> I was I was struck by my own uh, willingness 
to pick up a pitchfork and Mm -hmm. ruin the lives of those people who were literally chanting, F the Jews, gas the Jews. I just thought, yeah, I don't have any sympathy. I don't have any grace for you, you know? And I just, I don't, I don't honestly know what to make of myself as a result. That's where I, I mean, draw I the think line. That, I think that there's the talking and having a meaningful conversation about where we're drawing the line is a far more productive situation than, inf- than just enforcing things willy nilly. And I think that that's what cancel culture has been um, for so long. And it, you know, it's a, it's a meaningful conversation to have because I mean, cancel culture is a, a term that gets dragged through the mud and abused frequently. And it's one that neither Greg nor I actually really like all that much um, just because, you know, Vladimir Putin was saying he got canceled for invading Ukraine and um, people have said that Harvey Weinstein was canceled and right. you know there are there are points in time where there are, are actually consequences um, and so I, I definitely it's it's about having a meaningful conversation about where we draw the line and how we don't um, ascribe people's views to their personhood but at a certain point in time when things are so shameless and potentially um, could be you know it could be disastrous to a, a corporate setting to have someone who meaningfully believes that that their co-workers should be um, like the the subjects of genocide I mean that's that's a that's a conversation it's even, worth having I, I but just, it's so even the <laughs> fringe yeah I mean look you can't look into anybody's soul but when they show you, when they tell you what's in their soul, mm-hmm. we ought to believe them. Believe but it. Yeah. Then, then there's this whole new level of it's not one-on-one or small groups anymore. That's all gone to your earlier point. Yeah. We've all got this thing, which is essentially mm-hmm. um, a broadcast mechanism. I can go live right now on Facebook yeah. and broadcast our conversation to 6.3 million people. That mm-hmm. a, a lot of people can do a version of that, and so there's there a there's not enough time to thoughtfully get to a sensible conclusion, and b the minute you open your full head about it, you're probably doing it in front of the world, and so mm-hmm. you can't get the crap back in the goose. You it's very hard to walk back, gas the Jews, right? It's like well, what I yeah. meant, it's like you know, yeah. there's sorry, not a lot of subtext in that. <laughs> Not, what, of course. what did you mean? And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, you just have to be so careful, you know, where you run the pin through. Is it mm-hmm. the bachelorette? Is it the girl at the antebellum party? What about libs of, of TikTok? I heard somebody the mm-hmm. other day say, it's so unfair to target the libs of TikTok and that, you know, take the thing that they put on this public platform and then talk about it publicly because you'll ruin their lives. These people are going to have to live with the crazy things they've done and said. That's not fair. <laughs> and that's when I'm going, oh, no, dude, that is fair. I want mm-hmm. consequences for that. So mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, sometimes, though, I do think we actually mentioned lives of TikTok in our in our um, in our book and um you know, I think there's a whole host of there. Sometimes they'll post something that I think is literally a, a fireable offense for a teacher, but other times it could just be kind of poking fun at someone at hominem or or maybe their general appearances. I mean, it's it's definitely a case by case basis. Um, but I would say that sometimes there is a, a a pile on effect in a way that is definitionally cancel culture. As and you know, it's it's not always um, so kosher in my my opinion, sometimes unleashing it on just some random unwitting teacher somewhere who may have said something that was like a little beyond the pale. But, you know, if it is on a public platform, I do think that that is also a conversation worth having too. But I, I, I just want to, I loved your book, by the way. And, Thank and you. I marked a whole bunch of places. I'm only going to re- refer to one though, because it just, I remember when this happened and the clarity with this, this is when Constantine, Kissin mm-hmm. was invited to to give a speech. Chuck, I don't know if you if you remember this, but he was invited to talk to UNICEF, basically to do like, you know, an hour or a half hour of comedy. And of course he agreed. He's a big platform. And then he got this thing. <laughs> this is so awesome. <laughs> A charity benefit for UNICEF is the School of African and Oriental Studies in London. Upon accepting the unpaid gig, he was sent a behavioral agreement form. The title alone, the Soviet-born comic said, nearly made me puke. And here's what it says. It's only two (laughs) paragraphs. But this is real. And I think this is why your book 
is it is a bestseller. This comedy night aims to provide a safe space for everyone to come together to share and listen to comedy, with all proceeds donated to UNICEF. This is a chance for all to be entertained and overjoyed by the different performances here on this day, 23rd January 2019, hence the importance of this contract. This contract has been written to ensure an environment where joy, love, and acceptance is reciprocated by all. By signing this contract, you are agreeing to our no-tolerance policy with regards to racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, or anti-religion, or anti-atheism. All topics must be presented in a way that is respectful and kind. It does not mean that these topics cannot be discussed, but it must be done in a respectful and non-abusive way. You know, there we are. Sometimes the real world is beyond parody, I think. Yeah. That's what's so I mean, great about the Babylon Bee. I mean, oh, they yeah. keep nailing it. On, you know, they keep hitting it on the nose six months before it actually happens. It's crazy. Well, my favorite is their spinoff page that's not the bee of the actual real things like this that somehow feel like they're, they'd be too on the nose if they were fictional. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I mean, comedy, we have a whole case study on comedy because that's that's the cultural space where we're supposed to be able to kind of have this cathartic, uh, like pushing the, the, the edge, the edges of acceptable speech and laughing about it in a, in a way that's not hurtful or harmful. And yet, you know, I think the, the comedy that, ascribes to this contract is probably the least funny form of it frankly how could it how could it be <laughs> how i mean chuck sent me something this morning i was out right early from my walk what what's that guy's name chuck do you remember yeah I'm, i no, but i i i'm gonna look this uh, i ben, I, ben, I, ben, ben bankus ben bankus ben bankus you got to Google this, Ricky. It's, okay. I can't even share it. It's so inappropriate. I can't <laughs> yes. even joke about it, right? <laughs> but but I laughed so hard at what he said. And part of it was because I knew I wasn't supposed to laugh at this. Yeah. And that's totally. what I meant earlier when I said, I, I, can't, I can't get my, my arms around the idea that that the other side, whoever that is, really and truly believes, like whoever wrote that contract, I can't decide mm -hmm. if they really and truly believed it or if it was an attempt to virtue signal in some way in their own little bubble or if they were actually diabolically clever and, and just, you know, an anarchist who was trolling yeah. me and you and Greg, <laughs> by, by, by actually articulating something so completely harebrained, right? And so yeah. there's so many ways to get attention anymore. And I, 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 to your point, is it the B? Is it the post? Is it the headline? Is it the tweet? Is it not the B? Mm -hmm. what, it's just <laughs> a hot mess of ambiguity. Yeah. Well, I, I could... Probably based on what it, how I've seen some of of these sorts of not statements, but like you know, I like in clubs and stuff. I've I've heard people around the table crafting um, emails and stuff. And I I what I see often and what I saw at Lawrenceville and, and again at NYU was that there'd be you know little groups of of kids in in charge of things. And you know this is at a university, so there's probably I'm just making this up, but let's say there's five of them sitting around the table and one person says, oh my gosh, we have to make sure that whoever's coming in isn't going to say something offensive. And I'm, let's, let's make a list of all the ists and isms and everyone, you know, maybe one person totally disagrees, but isn't going to say anything. And the other three might kind of agree and, and go along with it. But it's, it's that tyranny of the minority sort of situation where something like this can just be one really overzealous and frankly, socially terrifying individual who would cancel anyone around them for dissenting mm -hmm. and everyone else is sort of like oh, okay that sounds okay to me um and i think that that happens a lot on these college campuses where we see these crazy statements that are the the product of the squeakiest wheel in the room and everyone else is just like too afraid to say are, are we sure about that? our friend uh todd rose who maybe you know, I know he's good friends with Greg Lukianoff. He runs a think tank called mm -hmm. Populous, and he he talks a lot about the tyranny of the minority and the fact mm -hmm. that 
you know, 80% of all the content on Twitter is actually created by 20% of the users. Yeah. And so the average visitor can very quickly form an assumption that all of that noise is a representative view of the majority. But of mm-hmm. course it's not. And and it, it's it's useful, I think, and important to to unveil that. And I think your book does that in a in a couple of different ways. But look, I promised Chuck in the new year we'd try and keep these things close to an hour. And I really just want to ask <laughs> you in as we land the plane here. Yeah. Can you can you talk to parents who have kids who like through this varsity blues lens who are who are so desperate to get them into the right school and kids who are getting so much pressure from their peers to get into the right school and borrow whatever it takes to do it yeah what's your advice to get a decent well-rounded liberal arts-based education which i still think has great value Mm -hmm. how would you do it in this Hmm. environment Hmm. yeah i mean it's so difficult and i i mean i'm i'm a dropout and I plan to be a dropout again with Columbia. I just, I'm taking John McWhorter's class, um, hopefully in the fall. And, and, you know, I think extracting what I, what I see is the most valuable resources from that school. But I walked into that school on Wednesday for the first time, um, and scanned my ID. And it was the school that I applied early to when I was 17. I, um, literally cried my eyes out and like could not eat for a day after I did not end up getting in. And, being there now as a 23 year old and looking around and and now being so much more um in tune to how 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 much these institutions have just totally made a a fool of themselves and have walked away from the the classical liberal values that make them or made them great institutions of learning i would say you know my my number one piece of advice right now um I can say as the kid who was walking into Columbia at the moment that it's not all that it, it's made out to be and that there are, I've been heartened by how many people in my life, FIRE changed their hiring policy to, to hire me. They actually had a college degree requirement and they they took that off the books to hire me. <laughs> nice. Um, and, cause, and Greg didn't even realize that that was there. And yeah. the, at the New York Post, I, I was fortunate that my, my editor Margie here basically gave me an, a, like crash course graduate degree in in journalism by actually doing it and holding my hand through it a little bit. And um, it was basically like a journalistic apprenticeship. And I I would say my number one piece of advice, if I were a parent right now, I accidentally took a gap year that turned into just dropping out um, during the pandemic. It would never have been the case. I was headed to law school. Um, That was my plan. I would say, let your kid take a gap year. Let your kid figure something out make them actually do something with it it better not be a a video game and social media year but having the actual experience of of testing the waters on the thing that you say that you want to do i was an environmental studies major when i applied to college i don't know what when what i was going to do with that or why that was my major um and don't underestimate just how little directional help your kid is getting in high school in terms of actually trying to to figure out what they want to do. I am so grateful that my parents, the day that I turned 16, it was the day that in Massachusetts you could legally get a job and I had a job that day and that was my first day of work. And I would say, get your kids working early, encourage them to to actually do internships in fields that they think they might be interested in. And if they decide that they're not, then that's a cause for celebration. And let them take some time off or, or, or you know, be a part-time student while uh, trying an apprenticeship and seeing if something sticks. And I also would say that if your kid does not graduate, the world, I can say in just the past two years of being a dropout, is becoming a lot more hospitable to people like me who who carve their own path because a lot of people are, are really suddenly waking up and realizing what a lot of people have been saying for a while, that these institutions are not all that they say that they are and they should not be the sole gatekeepers to success. Last question, Amen. real quick. Do you think, as guys like Bogosian argue, that we have to tear the whole thing down? Like, does it have to go splat before? I'm talking about the Ivy League <laughs> yeah. in particular. Like, how much yeah. worse does it have to get before the scales fall from our eyes? I think, 
I love Peter, by the way. I think he's great and brilliant. And um, his story is just hilarious to me with the um, the hoax papers. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I love these alternative institutions that are popping up here and there and a lot of experimentation. I would much rather see that. But I... I don't want it. I don't know that we have to tear it down and cancel higher ed. I think I, I would like to extend higher ed grace if it would like to reform. Um, <laughs> and I would also say, you know, I think that the most meaningful thing with these colleges and especially post October 7th, when I, I think that there's a less partisan scrutiny on them and it's just a more generalized suspicion, I would say that a market pressure of promising young kids who are saying, actually, that's not going to be my route to success and I'm going to prove that you can do it without it or I'm going to go to a state school and save a bunch of money and maybe get a graduate degree from the school if it's on better behavior in four years. I think a, I think there's a meaningful market correction coming um, and especially as more and more donors too wake up. So I, I am going to hold out faith. I would like for our elite institutions to be worth worthy of the praise that I think they are deeply unworthy of right now. But also I'm, I'm all in for the, the alternative institutions too. And I, I support that entirely. Lukianoff is lucky to have you. Uh, are you going to this thing this weekend over in, in Palm Springs? Uh, there's another no, stand together event. No, I, I, I saw Greg there at the last one and I'm, I figure he'll be there for this one, but who knows? You oh, I'm know missing out. Guy. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for making the time. Good luck thank at the you. post. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Write a great headline, something memorable. Oh, my gosh. I don't even get to write the headlines. Yeah. I'm not I'm not clever enough for that. The book is The Canceling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott. If you like the coddling of the American mind, or if that worried you, uh, you're going to like this even more, and it's probably going to worry you a little bit more. But the truth will set you free, <laughs> and this book is full of it. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. If you like what you heard, and even if you don't, oh, won't you please, won't you please, pretty please, pretty please, please, subscribe. Well, I hate to beg and I hate to plead, but please, pretty freaking please, please.